Thank you, Anne. And thank you to all of our panelists. I really appreciate your insights and experience uh, and sharing that with us today. And you teed up the final short panel just perfectly talking about what is coming next. So uh, future directions, what is on the horizon? I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague, Chris Hoffman from UC Berkeley Research IT, and he will introduce our final two panelists. So I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Camille. Um, great to see everybody here and great to be um, part of this event. I am Chris Hoffman. I'm the Associate Director for Research IT at UC Berkeley, and I'm a member of the PRP Science Engagement Team. So far today, we've heard from two panels. The second one described how the PRP continues to evolve as new technologies emerge and as new challenges are presented to this gifted and hardworking team of engineers and technologists. In the first panel, we heard from researchers across multiple disciplines who have provided those challenges that have inspired the team to continue pushing the envelope forward. Now let's hear from two important speakers who will talk about the future of this work. And importantly, this effort is as much social as it is technological and scientific. Simply put, how can we now bring the power and potential of the PRP to more communities, especially those who have been underserved so far? Based on what we've experienced over the last few years, I'm very confident that the problems that these communities bring will help keep the PRP advancing in new and important directions. First, we'll hear from Tom DeFanti. Tom is a research scientist at UCSD's Cal IT2 Qualcomm Institute and a distinguished professor emeritus of computer science at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Over a young career that spans more than 50 years, Tom has made legendary contributions to computer science and to applications in multiple disciplines. He is co-PI on the PRP project, as well as the Chase CI NSF Community Infrastructure Project for Machine Learning. Tom is equally famous for his role as a collaborator and mentor. Then we'll hear from Anna Hunsinger. Anna is Vice President, Community Engagement of Internet2, where she has executive management responsibilities for membership and engagement programs that support I2's members and community, including higher education, affiliates, and industry members. Anna is a passionate agent of change within research and education networking, where she champions efforts to increase diversity and inclusivity across our communities. This is important work we'll hear more about today and moving forward with the PRP. With that, I'll hand it over to Tom. All right, I should be up. Slides, yes. Full screen. Looks good. Okay, so uh, what's next? That's always fun to try to figure out. Um, so people use the terms PRP, NRP, JCI, and Nautilus interchangeably. They're really not. Um, PRP is a cooperative agreement and um, uh, it's now going into its seventh year. It is a, was set up to do a data movement platform. And, um, uh, and uh, Nautilus is essentially the um, resource in that uh, in, uh, combined with Scenic and Internet2 and so on, is the resource that's part of that platform or program as you might call it. Um, our first goal that we said seven years ago was to deploy ESNet's faster data.es.net recipes to transfer data between the NSF funded campus science DMZs, of which there are about 150, and to support applications. That was our first goal. And then our second goal was then to achieve using this infrastructure large disk to disk transfers of tens of gigabits per second. We were able to do this fairly rapidly, first with layer two and then later with the layer three infrastructures. Now, once we did this, and you know, Scott Sellers is the one who really took advantage of this early on to be able to move stuff out and then use it. Um, you know, the third goal, we said, well, now we've got this really fast, super low latency infrastructure put together. Uh, taking advantage of the science DMCs and the high-speed networks, how can we not have to move giant files around all the, all the time? Uh, this to me was kind of a revelation uh, because I thought that's all we had to do was move giant files around. But it turns out that if you leave the data where it is and use the Ceph regional pools that uh, Dima uh, set up uh, you, and access it from your cluster, 
uh, it works. You don't have to move it all. You just move the little bits you're working on. Now, the speed of light limits the usefulness of this to regions, uh, especially with the faster computers on the uh, high-speed networks. Um, so we built four pools, Eastern, Central, Western, and Pacific Islands. Um, it does chew up a lot of fast networking, um, and we need to do further measurements to really understand this. Uh, it turns out it's hard to measure. Uh, it's just not something that's easy to measure like many other things. The other thing to do is to move the containers to where the data is and compute there. Now, this is slick as long as the people who are hosting the data will also provide the compute cycles. And of course, that's not always possible, but with the Chase CI GPUs and CPUs all over the place, uh, these do provide compute cycles uh, in, within science DMZs that effectively do this. They allow you to move your computing to where the data is. A lot of people don't want their data to go very far. So this fulfills that need. Our fourth goal, and this is brought up in over and over again in the National Research Platform uh, meetings, was to embrace inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, or IDEA. And then the fifth goal and, uh, is to make PRP uh, easy, to, to have the easy button available. So here's the ex proposed extension of PRP and Nautilus in the, this year and the following few years. Uh, this slide is just loaded with information. It mostly doesn't include the existing things. It includes, um, um, it shows you the minority serving institutions, the EPSCOR institutions, the uh, MSI, non-MSI institutions that are um, uh, the focus of our expansions, and then uh, new GPUs and storage. You can't hold me to this because we haven't gotten funded yet, but boy, are we trying. So, um, yeah. Uh, and thank you for Scenic, uh, who created this quilt map, as I understand. It's um, certainly the most beautiful map of what we do in the background here. Okay, so here's the easy button. So what, uh, John touched on this a little bit, but they started building these things in uh, and putting them in GitLab. I can't go to all these things. I can't even understand all of them, but they are what allows people who don't wanna learn about Docker's and containerization and Kubernetes and anything to um, give one of these things to their students. And the next thing they know, they've got GPUs and CPUs allocated in a place and storage in a place that's useful to them. And um, this has much got to do with the, uh, the wonderfulness of, um, Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Hub and so on. So this is um, this is a real big difference, and this is a real community thing. And this isn't something that comes necessarily out of the clouds. This has got to do with us all talking and sticking together and doing things to help each other. So it's important on all your presentations to give credit where credit is due. And so I'm just going to end up with the fact that we have gotten some very fine awards, including this one, the first one and follow-ups, um, it's actually the second one, and um, that have enabled us um, to put together a team of people who can do this and will continue to do it. We've had fabulous support from UC and San Diego Supercomputer Center and all our partner campuses and the networks in particular have been the most amazingly responsive and wonderful people to work with. So with that, I am going to quit and give the rest of my time over to the other panelists and then Amy. <laughs>